yes, I believe Nepal does not have good education opportunities and many young people are migrating for the purpose of education. When you finish that education, when you get that experience, come back and whatever you learn, use it here, execute it here, show it here, do it here. Hi everyone, I'm Marty Logan. Thank you for choosing to listen to Nepal Now on the Move. This is our second episode since we started focusing on migration to, from, and within Nepal. Today, we're speaking with a returnee. Let me know what you think of this episode and if you have ideas for future guests. My email is nepalnowpod at gmail.com. I've done about 10 interviews to date for the show, and I can see that it's going to be much more difficult to find female guests than male ones. So please do send me tips about women who I might speak to. As a bit of a teaser, the people you're going to hear from in future episodes have, for example, gone to study in Canada, migrated to work in Kuwait, but had to return early and are now taking legal action against the people who sent them there, voluntarily left a rising career in Oman to return to Nepal to share the country's cultural values with their child, and worked for some months in the U.S., then some months in Nepal, and now continues to go back and forth regularly. The COVID-19 lockdown in New Delhi forced Ansal Dutt to develop baking skills in order to satisfy her sweet tooth. Anxieties about her parents living hundreds of kilometers away in her hometown, Sirket, pushed her to give up life in the mega city she had known from childhood to open a bakery in the small town once the restrictions had passed. Ansal is one of a very small minority of Nepalis who are immigrating to the country instead of emigrating. But her, their story, is important to hear if Nepal is to slow the now torrential flow of people leaving the country for what they hear are better opportunities abroad. Since I've been working on this revamp show, I'm quite sure that Ansel is the only young Nepali I've met who hasn't wanted to migrate and has actually returned here. The Cake House is now thriving as a family affair which I'm happy to say I witnessed when I was in Sirket. By the way, if you need a recommendation, the favorite sweet there is cheesecake. Ansel has also fallen in love with an alternative school that practices an holistic approach to learning, and she is teaching English there. She says she understands why young people are leaving the country, but passionately urges them to return to help build a better Nepal. Please listen now to our chat. Ansal Dutt, welcome to Nepal Now on the Move. Thank you. Nice to see you here in Kathmandu. Nice to see you too, Mari. We first met in Surakhet. Yeah, it was uh, great. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. I know you're really busy here in Kathmandu, so I appreciate you taking the time. Today I want to talk a little bit, we want to talk about your life story your short life story so far. You're quite young still. (laughs) Um, And now I know you're very busy. You have a business that you operate and you also have a job that you do every day. So we're certainly going to talk about those two things. But first, if you can just give me a quick overview of your earlier life, where you were born, grew up, went to school, that kind of thing. So I was born and brought up in Delhi. And I finished my education there, like I finished my master's there. And after doing my master's, I decided to come back to my hometown, that is Sirkhet. Okay. That's about me. <laughs> that was very fast. Yeah. That was a very headline <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, description. So, I'm so like tired of saying <laughs> these things again and again and again. So like I've shot it down. Like, this uh, is it. <laughs> I know the feeling. I get a lot of questions <laughs> about my life and what I'm doing here as well. Okay, great. So you grew up in Delhi. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're Nepali growing up in Delhi. Is that yeah. how you describe it? Yeah, probably. Okay. 
And then you did high school and college in Delhi? Or? Yes, in Delhi. Okay. And finished college and then decided... I finished decided, my master's there. Okay. And then I decided to come back to my hometown. Okay. There's more questions to come. <laughs> so what did you study? What did you do your master's in? I did my master's in social work. And then uh, had you thought long and hard about whether you would come back to Nepal or stay in Delhi, or was it just an automatic kind of journey for you? I always used to think that once I was retired, then I'll go back to Nepal, you know. I'll enjoy looking at the mountains. I'll enjoy the balcony view with the tea and cookies. I'll probably have my bakery somewhere in, near the hills, and I'll just feed to little kids. I'll be that old sweet grandmother. So I used to plan like that, but after COVID... Uh, I I realized that life's too short to wait for the retirement. <laughs> so, yeah, it was uh, during COVID times when I was away from my family because my parents were in Nepal and I was in Delhi. And Delhi has a lot of facilities, you know, you say education, you say hospitals. So I was not worried about myself during COVID, but I was extremely worried about my parents because they were in Nepal and Nepal doesn't have a lot of good you know, not not everywhere. Kathmandu has good hospital facilities, but when you look at the other parts of Nepal, they don't have it. So I was constantly worried. I was always worried that every night I would I would go to my bed thinking, will I wake up listening to my parents' hello or not the next morning? So I was like, I cannot wait for my retirement. The moment this whole COVID thing got over, I told my family that I want to move back to Nepal. I want to come to Nepal. I have this master's degree now. I'll get a job anywhere. I was pretty confident about that. Uh, But then during COVID times, I was also, I was someone who never entered kitchen in my life. You know, it was it was my brother or it was my mother who were who were they were so interested about cooking and all of those things. I was I was never interested in all of that. But during COVID times, I was always craving for sweet items. I could not get it anywhere. So I would always first initially I would watch YouTube and I would try to make it by myself. Sometimes it was amazing. Like I I could not believe myself. And sometimes it was even hard to cut a cake with a knife. <laughs> so after that, I decided that, okay, I should, I should get some training. I should get some extra skills. So I joined, I joined the baking classes for like a year. And uh, I was like, okay, maybe I should start a bakery right now. <laughs> maybe I should just go to Nepal and open a bakery right away. Um, so initially, my father was like, uh, what am I going to tell to everyone that my daughter has a master's degree and now she's baking cakes. <laughs> you want me to go to people and tell that? And I was like, I don't know. You are responsible for that. I'm just going to do my thing. <laughs> my brother was very supportive. He was always supportive of business ideas. I had this confidence that the worst that can happen is the business is, is going to fail. And I'll have to pay back all the loans. But when this idea came up, I was only 25. So I was like, I'm, I'm just 25. I can do a lot of hard work. Even if the business fails, I can get a job anywhere because I do have a master's degree. I do have some experience. I can get a job anywhere. So why not give this a chance? And even if it fails, because I'll know after an year or so that the business is not doing good. Because of that master's degree, I had that confidence that even if the business fails, I've got my education, I can go anywhere, I can get a good job, and from that amount, from my salary, I can pay back the loan. The business is doing great now. I'm very happy with that. And also, I'm I'm teaching. I'm teaching in this school called Kopila Valley School. The vision of this school is every child is safe, educated, and loved. And one day, a teacher, a teacher from that school, she came to my bakery and she said, I want you to come to our school and meet our children. Then I was like, I would love that because I've heard a lot about that school. And when I visited the school for the first time, it was, it was love at first sight for me. Maybe I, should, maybe I should just do something for these kids. That's the first thought that came in my head. And after a few months, uh, I got an opportunity, like I got a chance to 
joined that school and I said yes in the blink of an eye. <laughs> now that's a long introduction that you were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is it. Thank you. <laughs> but that's incredible. There's lots of very interesting things there. So, okay, the baking bug. So you you needed some sweet a sweet fix during COVID. Yeah, yeah. You started baking, and some of it was good enough to really get you thinking about yeah. how do I bake? Maybe I open a bakery. So then you went back, and it sounds like things went very quickly from idea mm-hmm. to return mm-hmm. to getting your loan, finding a place, and setting up your yeah. bakery. Yeah. And then while you were doing all of that, you also learned about the school visited the school, right? and suddenly you now have a second major work thing happening in your life. Yeah. That's a lot. So tell me first about the bakery. Once you got beyond the fairy tale part of it, <laughs> did it go as you imagined? Like, did you find a place that you had thought of, and did it kind of play out the way you uh, thought it would? Or what's it like today? How did you get there? So when I was in India... Uh, Right near my home, uh, there was this small shop. Whenever I would visit that shop, I would see three young ladies doing something in this big bowl. Someone was melting the chocolate. Someone was putting it. So they were all planning to open a bakery or maybe something like that. Initially, they were just doing it online. But because I was right opposite to them, they wouldn't mind even if I visit that store. I didn't know them, but they were sweet enough to let me in and they were just three really young girls. And I was like, wow, <laughs> their, their, their parents are letting them <laughs> to do this. So I was a bit inspired by those young ladies. But uh, right after a few months, that shop, it closed down. And then I got like, I was, I was feeling very sad for them that maybe, oh, they couldn't do it. I loved their enthusiasm. I, I loved how they were just starting something. They were not following the usual track of after bachelor's, I do my master's and then I get a job of nine to five. They were starting something else. Uh, but then one day I was going to the main market with my brother and we saw this big shop and the young ladies were right there. I was like, oh, my God, from that tiny shop, they have come here. And then after a few months, I went to another market and they had their branch right there as well. And that inspired me like anything. And I'm like, wow, I have heard a lot about so many inspiring people in my life via Internet or via newspapers or from my books. But I think for the young generation, it is very, very important to actually see it from your own eyes. I decided that when I go back to my hometown, I want the kids to be inspired or to be motivated or to actually see it. Because I do believe in this quote by Mahatma Gandhi where he said, be the change you wish to see in the world. You know, uh, I have seen a lot of uh, younger generation always complaining about, we don't have this in Nepal, we don't have this in Kathmandu, we don't have this in Surkhet. Surkhet is such a small town. They are always complaining, complaining, complaining. And I'm like, we can do something about it. If, if, if I want to see young businesswoman, maybe I should start by being one. And yes, I, I wanted my, I have my sisters back there. First, I wanted them to see that this is possible, this is doable. My sisters have seen me working hard from morning five to ev- like to late, late night. And now I, a lot of college girls, they come to my shop and they ask me about how I started it. And I have also seen them doing small, like they have shared their small business ideas with me and they're like, we want to do this, we want to do that. I'm always pushing them, go, 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 go. You are you can do it. It's, it's the people who can make it better in some ways or the other. That's what I strongly believe in. I've been to your bakery. Yeah. It's very nice. It's in a great location. You know, I really like that area. Um, And it's fairly visible as well, I think. Mm -hmm. So you probably get a lot of walk-in traffic and people curious to check out a bakery because I don't (laughs) think there are that many bakeries in Sirkat, right? So you said earlier that the business is going well. Does that mean that, uh, is it only you? Do you have people working for you or 
How do you so run it on a day to day? It's uh, it's more like a family business, you can say, because me and my sister in law, we both learned baking together. And when I started the business, my sister in law got pregnant, and she was on rest for like a few months, and then. My brother, he really helped me a lot. My younger brother, my elder brother who was in Delhi, he was always very supportive. My younger brother was always there with me whenever I needed him. Uh, so my family was very supportive of that. So it's, now it has become more like a family business. That's really interesting. I was speaking to someone I was interviewing, and they had worked in the Gulf, a Gulf country, for more than a dozen years, or about mm-hmm. a dozen years, um, in a retail kind of operation. And so did very well and kind of started at a low level and moved up into management, uh, had a really good career going. And in 20, or before 2020, before COVID hit, he and his family decided they, want to come, they wanted to come back to Nepal. And so they came back, and one of the first things he did was start a small business. And very quickly, within some months, he gave it up. And the reason he gave it up was kind of the red tape, all of the forms you have to fill out and offices you need to go to and, you know, to get a business established. But I get the feeling listening to you that this is very much for you. You're very happy about being your own boss and and, um, investing in your own business and it's going well. Uh, the thing that you mentioned about all those red tapes and other things uh, to support women and to encourage women, the Nepal government they have this loan called Women Empowerment Loan, where they provide somewhere around fifteen lakhs to a woman or to a girl who wants to start a business. It's for it's especially for the business purpose. So I got to know about it because. I had just finished my master's and I did not have a lot of money. And like I said, my father did not want me to do business initially because he wanted me to have a good job because I had a master's degree and he was like, you can get a job anywhere. Initially, he was not happy with the idea of me moving back to Nepal so early. He wanted me to get a lot of experience in Delhi, but uh, I wanted to come back to Nepal. And Nepal has this loan, like I said, this woman empowerment loan. My brother told me about that. And like, I was like, we need to go for it. Let's have that. Because I did not want to ask any money from my parents, from my family. I had a few savings and I used that. So for that, whenever you have to start a business, you need to show, like, I bought one machine and I showed them the venue where I'll be doing the place, my shop, this is the place. And I bought one machine, I kept it there. And I was like, okay, I had money this much. Now I need more money from you. So the bank people, they would come and they would see. And when they are convinced that, yes, this person is actually going to start a business, then they provide you that that much amount, 15 lakhs. And yeah, I started my business like that. And and it it wasn't so hectic for me. Uh, It was was pretty smooth. I don't want to forget this. (laughs) Last time I was there... And we, we had a chat. You told me about a group of people who had become possibly your some of your best customers. Uh-huh. And I was very surprised <laughs> to hear this. Do you want to tell that? Can you, can you just give me more? Can you, can you know more about that? There's a prison or more than one prison in Sirkat. Yeah, yeah, there is. And they're also customers. They're my... They're my best customers. Yeah. <laughs> I'd that's say that. What, that's what I would say that. So, so once we also do delivery, and uh, there was there was this day when I get a call, and they ask me to deliver an eight pound cake. In eight pound, yeah. cake. I didn't even know you made eight pound cake. <laughs> yeah. So they ask me to deliver an eight pound cake in a prison. And I had to reconfirm the address again because, A, I had no idea where the prison was. B, I was shocked because he said, prison. But I didn't want to sound so rude. And I was like, okay, can you please tell me the address again? And I was asking about the nearby 
localities that's there, nearby shop that's there. And he was like, yes, I need it there. And then he was asking about all the other props as well, like a hat or something. And after, again, when he placed that order, I got another call from another person. And uh, he said that uh, I need another two pound cake. And he mentioned the same name. So that was a bit surprising for me. I wanted to go there personally to deliver that order because I had never seen a prison before. I mean, not from inside. I was not allowed to go inside. But there were, there were guards there at the gate. And they would ask you to taste the cake yourself first. No. Because they want to make sure that you haven't mixed anything inside. And then it goes inside for everyone really? who are there. Yeah. So they do that every time you go? Or only not that? only not only me. But when every delivery, they yeah, would do with that. every delivery, you need to taste it yourself first, and then only it goes inside. And I pretty much like that idea, to be honest. Uh. Like they care about the prisoners, or and the other people. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So th- now, how often do you make cakes for that prison? Or I don't know if there's more than one. We get uh, we get like six to seven orders in a month. From from that that one prison, and these are prisoners who are like ordering cakes for their friends, right? I think. Birthday, s- like I think it's a, sometimes sometimes it's it's the prisoners who probably take who probably request the guards to order for for them because it's 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 a bit rude to ask, "Are you a prisoner or are you <laughs> are you the police?" So I don't really ask that, but I think it's. Sometimes it's the guards as well because they do ask me to mention the post of this particular man and sometimes it's the superintendent, sometimes it's the commissioner. So when when we see that post, we get to know that, okay, it's for this, but sometimes it's for the other people who are also working as a kitchen staff and sometimes I think it's, it's the prisoners as well sometimes. That, yeah, that's the, the astonishing thing about that is Obviously, when you think of prisoners, you think of tough people, hardened people, not people with a soft side. And mm-hmm. obviously, that's a cliche. And of course, people have different sides, no matter where they're living and what they've done. But still, you wouldn't think of like these guys sitting around a table singing happy birthday to one another. Uh, I think the main purpose of keeping a person in a prison is to help that person become a better person. And I think the police and the other people of that prison, prison of that particular prison, are doing a pretty good job because of the amount of cakes order that I'm getting. <laughs> 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 They're doing a pretty good job them being them this soft, kind, you know, that kind of person. So, yeah. At least but I, I never imagined that it would be something like that. Like you said, I would always imagine a prisoner being this tough guy, this hardcore guy who is bad and all the things that we see in movies. But it's not like that, <laughs> maybe. Apparently not, Un- yeah. unless there's like, you know, three or four office staff who are getting really big bellies just from <laughs> eating all those cakes. Yeah. I guess you'll never know unless you go inside. Mm-hmm. So tell me briefly uh, a little bit about Kopila Valley School because that's now become a completely other part of your life. When I was in Delhi, I did hear about this school called Kopila Valley School as the founder of the school got the CNN Hero Award. And when I was reading the news and reading about her, I got to know that she has opened this huge school in Surkhet. But I never got the chance to visit that school. But once I shifted permanently, I got to know the people. I got to meet the people who were working in that school. And uh, one day, the founder herself, she visited my bakery. And I always wanted to meet her. And when I met her, it was, it was beautiful just to see her and how she was showing the love to all the kids. She came along with eight, ten kids from the children home, and they they were all just enjoying. I was just constantly looking at her, 
and we got to know about each other that day. We introduced, she introduced herself, even though she didn't have to, and I introduced myself, and she has already heard a lot about me from other people. And later, after a few months, I got this opportunity to be the English teacher in that school, and um, I said, yes, I am free early in the morning, so probably I can start from part-time. It's, it's not a normal school where children just go and they pay their fees. A lot of kids there are orphan. A lot of the kids come from the disadvantaged section of the society. The education, the food, everything is free there till grade 12. And there are different school, there are different programs in that school, like health and wellness program is there, where we are also taking care of our own kids. We are also taking care of the family of the kids who need counseling or who need some regular assistance with that. That's this program called sustainability program, you know, where we are integrating sustainability with the curriculum that's provided by the government. For example, last year there was this uh, hole from grade three to grade eight, I think. They, like children, were taken to vegetable farms. They were taken to cow farms. They were taken to different, different places. So place-based learning is there. Then we integrated it with the curriculum that's there with maths, with English, with science, with social, whatever they saw there, how, how is it related with the things that we are reading in the books? So that was super amazing. It sounds very all-encompassing and very kind of holistic. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like a really good <laughs> learning tool as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And in terms of you personally, so now, as I was saying, you have two big additional responsibilities in your life. You have the business, which you explained your family is really helping out with, but it's still also your responsibility. And now you have this job as a responsibility and you're here in Kathmandu with that job as well, with a couple of students. How has it been juggling those two with, I'm sure you have a little bit of time for your personal life, I'm <laughs> sure. How has it been keeping everything going? Uh, so someone told me, when you love what you do, then it's not a job. I, I, someone told me this many years ago, and I think that's 100% that's true. Like my cousins and my other friends, they keep complaining about, what about your personal life? There's no personal life. You don't have a personal life. And I'm like, what is a personal life? <laughs> what is this life that you're talking about? <laughs> because... I, I love my bakery. When I started my bakery, I had this vision that whenever I will employ, whenever I will have a new employee, it has to be a woman. It has to be a girl. Because I want the girls of Surkhet, I want the women of Surkhet to see that when we actually want to do something, it's doable, it's achievable. With your hard work, with your determination, with your confidence, it's achievable. So my first vision for my bakery was I do not want any male employee. It's, it's a delivery. A girl will do it. It's baking a cake. A girl will do it. <laughs> it's anything. Girls can do anything. I just wanted them to see it. And that, that that was my vision. That is still my vision. I only have girl employees. Sometimes my brother does enter the kitchen and we kick him out. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guys. <laughs> and I, I love, I love that place. I love my bakery. I love being with the girls. I love seeing them growing and learning. And in my, in Kopila Valley School as well, whenever I see the kids, whenever I see them you know, trying to be better, even if they make a lot of mistakes sometimes, even if they fight, no matter what they do. I just love being around them. And it's like I don't need a break, actually, because when I have a break, I get bored. I do manage to take some time out for my family, 
whenever I have a two or three day off from school, I just spend my time with the, my with my family, with my little nephew. I take my parents out sometimes. And yeah, that's that. So how long has it been now since you left Delhi? I came in March 2022. It's, it's 2024 now. Almost two years. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm guessing you never thought seriously about maybe I should have stayed in Delhi. No, not even for a single day. I Delhi is an amazing place. I have, I've got great memories there. I've spent my whole childhood there. It's the most comfortable place for me in the world. I can say that because I know it. I know, like, I know where to go. I know, I know, oh, this is my place. This is that. But also, it has been two years in Surkhet. And I can literally go anywhere and say, she's my person or he's my person. You know, that bonding, that attachment is there, even if we are not blood related. But people are always there for you, even though they don't know you. Like, even though they have just seen me in my bakery shop and they have never talked to me, but they know me like that. And even when I don't ask for any help, they will be there. And I've seen that not only in Surkhet, but uh, like a few weeks ago, I was in Rukum with my friends. We just wanted to explore Rukum. And I am not a kind of person who loves to trek or who loves to hike, but I'm still learning. I'm still learning to walk on those trails. I fall more than 10 times in an hour, but I'm still learning. And there was, there was this place where I was extremely tired and I was just sitting under a tree. And then a couple, a couple came out from their tiny house and they came to me and they said, are you hungry? <laughs> I was extremely hungry at that time. <laughs> but, and I was like, uh, I, I, I did not say yes. I did not say no. And they went inside. They got me two chapatis. They got me this pure honey that they got from their own beehive thing. And they were like, please have it. And after that, my few friends, they also joined me and they they got all of it for all of us. Wow. So this is the beauty of Nepal, I think. People are always there for you. Like, I, I, I can walk freely on the roads of Sirkhet without fearing anything, without fearing about anything. But in Delhi, it's a bit hard. It's like someone is always looking at you. Someone, is always, someone always wants to grab you whenever you are in a bus or something. It's like you are surrounded by so many people, but how many people are there for you, actually? Many, many people come back to Nepal. Many, obviously, are leaving and they don't come back for a long time, but others will come back to try it, right? Like they'll come back, they want to set up a business or they want to get a job, they want to return to Nepal. But not all of them, and I would guess probably many of them don't have the same kind of positive experience that you had. So I know it's very hard to speak generally, but what would you say to people who, let's say they're, they're thinking of coming back so that they could maybe be more prepared, have a better mindset? You must have had moments where things weren't going well. What advice would you give people who are thinking of coming back? I do have a few cousins who are planning to go to Australia. One of my cousins, he just left for UK. And I have always been the one who's always saying, please don't go, stay here. You can make it here. Please don't go, stay here, you know. And I've got a few cousins who are still living in abroad. And I keep telling them, you need to come back. You cannot be there all the time. Because if not us, then who will? We have a lot of problems that's the problem. We don't have this. We don't have that. We need this. We need that. But how? Or who? Or when? We need to think about that, I think. And I would always say, if you are saying, 
like for example like I, like I told you if if I was the one who would always complain about we don't have this in circuit like if we say we don't have kind speaking people in circuit why don't you be the kind speaking person let's start with you then maybe someone in your family will learn maybe your kids will learn that's how we make it a better place but it is a very slow process and if you think about nepal it's a very 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 slow process but this generation wants everything very quickly like i want an iphone next month now an iphone costs more than 2 lakhs you will not get a job right away after your masters even after your masters a 2 lakh job anywhere in nepal a few year ago i never thought that i'd be sitting here giving an interview about the whole my whole success story or anything even though i'm not so successful right now but yes i believe nepal does not have good education opportunities and many young people are migrating for the purpose of education when you finish that education when you get that experience come back and whatever you learn use it here execute it here show it here do it here you don't have to do it for a hundred people do it for two people start with that i do agree nepal does does have very very limited job opportunities okay if you really want to go out go out learn do savings come back and try it here you will not get the exact same amount in dollars but maybe your kids or maybe your grandkids will be proud of you because you created this world for them okay <laughs> final question your dad was reluctant for you to come and he was also reluctant for you to open a bakery instead of using using your education mm-hmm. how is he now how does he feel about what you're doing oh so now now he would bring his friends all the time and he would just proudly say that she's my daughter she's doing this she also teaches in kopila valley school and then he would look at me and say don't take any money from them <laughs> 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 because they are my friends <laughs> and yeah he's he's pretty proud he's very proud of that and i'm happy that i'm able to be that daughter yeah very good <laughs> Thank you very much for telling me Thank this story. Thank you Mari for having me. Thank you once again to Ansal Dat for making time to talk to me during a busy trip to Kathmandu. Let us know what you thought of this episode and how you feel about the various changes we made to Nepal now from new music and opening to the people-centered approach to the focus on migration. We're at Nepal Now Pod on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Next time we'll be talking to Bharat Adhikari, who returned from Oman, started a small business, then quickly gave it up. I'll talk to you next time.